Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The Committee on Veterans Affairs Subcommittee on Economic Opportunity Hearing on Federal Contracting Compliance will come to order. Before I begin with my opening statement, I'd like to state that Mr. Scott Denniston, Director of Programs for the National Veteran-Owned Business Association, has asked to submit a written statement for the hearing record. There's no objection. I ask for unanimous consent that his statement be entered for the record. Hearing no objection, so entered. Providing our service members and veterans with employment opportunities is indeed a way of investing in our brave men and women of the armed forces for the sacrifices they've made while serving our country. Providing them with opportunities and establishing equity and employment opportunities can help veterans become gainfully employed. The U.S. Department of Labor's Office of Federal Contract Compliance Program plays an important role in protecting veterans by ensuring that they're not discriminated against and are given equal employment opportunities. While OFCCP provides certain veterans protection against discrimination, it also requires that contractors are actively involved in providing employment or advancement opportunities for, by providing outreach, recruitment, and training. In addition, contractors must make good faith efforts to maximize their current qualified workforce, develop and update affirmative action plans, and submit an annual report to the Department of Labor. The Vietnam-era Veterans Readjustment Assistance Act of 1974, also known as VEVRA, and Section 4212 of Title 38 provide legal authority to enforce veterans' equal employment opportunities. VEVRA provides enforcement for federal contracts to provide equal employment opportunities for special disabled veterans and veterans of the Vietnam era. This provision would apply to prime contractors and subcontractors who engage in personal property and non-personal services, including construction. All employment is required to be listed in the Federal Contractor Job Listing Program, which gives priority referral to qualified disabled veterans and Vietnam-era veterans. Currently, the OFCCP provides enforcement measures for compliance. For example, compliance reviews are conducted to ensure that employers are following their affirmative action program established as a prerequisite for reaching a contract threshold. To assist in this effort, OFCCP provides training, consultations, and technical assistance to contractors. I've become deeply concerned over reports of federal contractors not complying with federal regulations. This is especially troubling considering the increased number of service members returning to the civilian workforce. It's also disturbing when I hear that disabled veterans' hiring practices are inadequate, coupled with the lack of, of effort by contractors to employ disabled veterans. Federal contractors and subcontractors have the opportunity to work with the Department of Veterans Affairs Vocational Rehabilitation and Employment Program or the Department of Labor's Veteran Employment and Training Service, both of which are equipped to assist veterans gain employment. These resources, along with the Leavers and DVOPs, should provide for contractor compliance. I'm hopeful that today we can determine to what extent these enforcement measures are beneficial, if they lack incentives for compliance, or if there is a need for stricter enforcement measures. I look forward to exploring the options to assist employers who are making good faith efforts in hiring and promoting qualified disabled veterans in the workforce. This subcommittee is fully committed to protecting our veterans and providing protections against employment discrimination. Finally, today's hearing is an important one. It is the first time this subcommittee has held a hearing on federal contractor compliance. Therefore, we hope that we're able to learn more about the issue while conducting oversight and gaining from the insight provided to us by our witnesses on the topic. I now recognize our distinguished ranking member, Congressman John Bozeman, for any re opening remarks he may have. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. The current recession is affecting veterans just like the rest of the American labor force. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the unemployment rate among adult men was 9.4 percent and adult women was 7.1 percent. Interestingly, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics does, does collect data on veterans in its monthly report, but does not pu publish their data. One would think that given the current war on terror uh, and the recognition that veterans are an important sector of society, veterans would be included in any national level unemployment report. The following table from the Veterans Employment and Training Service illustrates today's employment challenges for veterans and as you will see, things are not good. Everything's working. Our slide is up there. I'm impressed. 
using two thousand and eight national data for comparison it appears that veterans in general continue to have lower unemployment rates than their non veteran counterparts however that same data shows that younger veterans still experience significantly higher unemployment rates than older veterans and non veterans that veterans are supposed to have some advantages in seeking employment in the private sector especially by companies that are federal contractors title thirty eight section forty two twelve requires federal contractors to take affirmative action to hire veterans and test state employment services in the department of labor with its roles in promoting hiring by federal contractors i believe each of those bear some responsibility in achieving the goals of section forty two twelve while there are many reasons for higher unemployment among younger veterans lack of attention to veterans in general by the federal government should not be among those reasons for the for example in addition to not being identified in d l s data section forty two twelve c of title thirty eight requires the department of labor to report annually on veteran hiring by federal contractors including that report the law requires the following data the number of complaints filed against federal contractors the actions taken by the department on those complaints the results of the department's actions on those complaints the number of contractors listing job openings the nature and types of positions the number of veterans given priority referral by the local employment services if one looks at the section on federal contractor compliance in pages twenty and twenty one in the most recent deal report there is no data on actions taken to investigate complaints regarding contractors affirmative action to hire veterans i hope the office of federal contractor compliance uh, can explain to us this lack of focus uh, for us today section forty two twelve also includes several requirements for information to be supplied annually by federal contractors which are included in the vets one hundred report which should form the basis for the department's annual report to congress I have a feeling that the only time anyone looks at the VETS 100 report is when DOL receives a congressional inquiry. Finally, the question of enforcement raises an issue of common sense. We hear suggestions that failure to have an affirmative action plan or submit the VETS 100 report should be grounds for debarring a company from doing business with the federal government. While I fully support affirmative hiring under Section 4212, uh, it's not really we, we really don't think that the federal government is going to bar uh, a contractor like Lock Lockheed or IBM or Pfizer or Boeing. The only alternative is to find such companies and there's no provision in the current law. I also believe we should take a close look at whether placing the investigation responsibility for OFCCP is the right thing to do and whether that responsibility should more properly reside in vets. Madam Chair, the situation surrounding Section 4212 is less than optimal, and uh, I hope that we can all work together to fix it. And I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Bozeman. Uh, we do have a vote uh, pending. There are about 11 minutes remaining, so we'll invite the first panel up and recognize our first witness, uh, and then we'll have to recess, uh, take a short recess to go vote. Uh, so let me welcome uh, the first panel uh, with us at the subcommittee today. Joining us is Mr. Thomas Whitaker, President of the National Association of State Workforce Agencies and Deputy Chairman, Chief Counsel of the North Carolina Employment Security Commission, accompanied by Mr. Chad Sowas, Ms. Christina Ruth, National Deputy Legislative Director for AMVET, Mr. Joe Sharp, Director of the National Economic Commission for the American Legion, and Mr. Rick Weidman, Executive Director for Policy and Government Affairs for the Vietnam Veterans of America. He's on his way, I think. Um, so because we only have 10 minutes now, uh, Mr. Whitaker, is your presentation, uh, do you need a little bit longer than five minutes? If so, I'll recognize Ms. Ruth and we'll take you up when we come back. But if you can keep it to five. Okay, then you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Whitaker. Good afternoon. Chairwoman uh, Herseth, Scanlon, and Representative Bozeman. On behalf of the National Association of State Workforce Agencies, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today on federal contractors hiring practices and the performance of the U.S. Department of Labor, OFCCP, and monitoring federal contractor job listing compliance. 
NASWA's members are the state leaders of the publicly funded workforce system vital to meeting the employment needs of veterans through the Disabled Veterans Outreach Program known as DVOP and the Local Veterans Employment Representative or LVER program. In, in 2007, NASWA offered its members a new and free online labor exchange service called Job Central National Labor Exchange. We refer to that as the NLX. The NLX is a sophisticated job search engine, which is a result of a partnership between NASWA and the Direct Employers Association, DEA, a trade association of over 485 Fortune 500 companies. State job banks across the United States can now transmit job orders to each other, plus receive thousands of job orders via electronic download from DEA, DEA members. Job orders are updated daily, avoiding duplication and thus ensuring job opportunities are open for veterans in a very timely manner. FCJL compliance is provided through Vet Central, a sister site of the National Labor Exchange. OFCCT regional staff have recently been providing inconsistent guidance to states and employers about Vet Central's validity as a compliance mechanism. The situation was quickly addressed when National OFCCT at the urging of NASWA responded offering guidance to the field staff. We are hopeful that the OFCCT's response will meet the needs of our members, the employers, and ultimately provide veterans with additional job opportunities. Based on our experience with Vet Central and OFCCT, as well as valuable feedback received from the state workforce agencies, we would like to offer the following recommendations. Number one, federal contractor list. NASWA's first recommendation is for OFCCT to develop and maintain an official list of federal contractors who fall within federal contractor job listing requirements. This list should be shared with state workforce agencies who per regulation have a legal responsibility to refer only eligible veterans to federal contractor federal job listing contractors. As an example, in the last nine months, my department in North Carolina has made almost 500 veteran job development contacts to companies considered to be federal contractors. But without an official list, my agency cannot ever be sure whether they are speaking with FCJL contractors or not. Number two, increase staff. Our second recommendation is for additional OFCCT staff. In North Carolina, my agency was told that it would take up to six months for OFCCT to arrange a meeting with my agency and employers. It is common in many states to have no contact between state workforce personnel and OFCCT staff. That's unacceptable. Number three, training. Our third recommendation is for a comprehensive training of OFCCT field staff to ensure laws and regulations are administered properly and uniformly. Number four, clarify and communicate roles of all involved. Our final recommendation is for the U.S. Department of Labor to clarify and communicate the appropriate roles and responsibilities of all involved federal agencies and state entities. NASWA would be pleased to assist in this effort by initiating a meeting between our members and the relevant U.S. Department of Labor agencies and possibly employers. Thank you again for the opportunity to comment, and we stand ready to work on these issues. Thank you, Mr. Whitaker. Uh, did you ha have a, a presentation at, the, at this point? Uh, yes. And about how long does that take? It, it will take uh, five minutes. Um, that will bring us down to zero time remaining on the vote. So while we'll probably have 15 minutes after that, uh, I know the majority leader is interested in trying to address this issue sooner rather than later. So we probably will have to come back to the presentation um, because we don't want to rush you, uh, but we do need to head over to the Capitol now. So we'll recess for probably my best guess is about 30 minutes and, and we'll return, okay? Thank you. <laughs> 